According to a survey in HR magazine a couple of years ago, January is the month most people are likely to think about changing jobs. Why January? Perhaps it's the trigger of a new year where it's traditionally the time we set ourselves new goals. Perhaps it's the need to give ourselves a post-festive season boost. Or perhaps it's the return to the same old thing after some time off. And with people now expected to have an estimated 10 to 15 different jobs during their career, a change of role is almost inevitable now, isn't it? But before you take the plunge and quit your day job in search of something new, why not seek out advice from people who've had successful careers to see what you can learn from what they've achieved? Hello, I'm Helen McKenzie, Principal Advisor at Procurious. Welcome to today's webinar, Don't Quit Your Day Job, your path to the top. I'm delighted to be joined on the webinar today by three panel members. Lara Nakwish-Bandy, Finance Director, Google UK. Christina Morrow, Director, Global Procurement, Rico USA. And Imelda Walsh, who is Manager at Procurus's sister company, The Source. Our first guest, Lara Nakwish-Bandy, is currently the UK Finance Director for Google. Prior to Google, Lara worked at the mining company Rio Tinto, where she was the CFO of Rio's commercial group. In this role, she supported the company's sales and marketing, procurement, marine and logistics activities globally. Lara began her career at Goldman Sachs, then worked at Bridgewater Associates, the Boston Consulting Group, and in private equity before moving to Rio Tinto. Lara has a BA in economics from Harvard University and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Welcome to the webinar, Lara. Thanks, Helen, delighted to be here. Also joining me today is Christina Morrow, the Director of Global Procurement at Rico USA, Inc. Christina is responsible for the strategic development, implementation and execution of indirect procurement, sourcing, negotiation, and supplier management strategies for Rico globally. Christina also manages Rico's Supplier Diversity Program and Strategy to increase procurement efforts with diverse suppliers and provide further value to customers. Christina is focused on streamlining processes, creating efficiencies, reducing costs, and building mutually beneficial partnerships. She is an active member of Rico's Corporate Diversity and Social Responsibility team. During her 19 years with Rico, Christina has held a variety of roles within procurement. In 2012, 2016, and 2019, she was named in Diversity Plus magazine as a top 30 champion of diversity. She was also on a top women in diversity list in 2014. Christina graduated from St. Joseph's University, Philadelphia with a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. Welcome to the webinar, Christina. Thanks for having me. My final guest today is Imelda Walsh. Imelda is the manager of The Source, a boutique procurement recruitment and executive search firm that is one of Australia's most well-known procurement recruiters. With over half a decade of experience in procurement recruitment alone, Imelda's made a name for herself as the go-to recruiter for anyone wanting to carve out a successful career in procurement. She supported clients to successfully recruit to the range of positions from analyst to CPO. Hailing from Ireland, Imelda is passionate about making an impact. The thing she loves most about her role is how good advice can transform people's careers and ultimately their lives. Welcome to the webinar, Imelda. Thank you, Helen. It's great to be here. Okay, so let's get started with our first question. Our listeners may be starting um, this new decade thinking that it's time to embark on something new in their working life if they've decided they wanted to take that next step in their career, do you think it's important for them to have a plan? Let's start with you, Lara. I think it always helps to have a plan, Helen, um, because then if you, if you know where you want to go, then you can obviously work backwards from that. However, I don't think that um, you necessarily need to have a plan to think about where you're going with your career, and sometimes just trying to figure out how you can build more options and actually try things out is a good way to... Um, build your career without having a very clear view of where you want to end up. Okay, do you think that perhaps having a plan is a bit counterintuitive then? Um, I do actually, because I think that people get intimidated by the need to have a plan and a very clear vision, when actually there's a real merit in 
taking some time to figure out what you want to do and taking on new opportunities and, and roles that allow you to flesh that out. Too often when um, people have come to me sort of talking about what they want to do next, they get stuck at the first hurdle, which is they don't know what they want to do next. They just know they're not in the right place now. And I think that that can sometimes lead to a paralysis when, in fact, just because you don't know what you want to do in the future doesn't mean that um, there's not a merit in just being experimental. So planning, but more experimental planning, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely, it does. Are you a planner, Christina? I am a planner in the sense that I'm always asking myself what's next. I feel it's important for everyone to have some sort of plan, very similar to what Laura said, um, in order to not become complacent in your role for several years and become unhappy. Um, I think, you know, the first step in planning should always be to ask yourself, how do you define professional success? Is it financial? Is it self-fulfillment? Is it climbing the corporate ladder? Or is it just that work-life balance? I know for me, um, it used to be financial, but as I get older, work-life balance and generally feeling that overall sense of accomplishment has really become more than important than ever. Okay, so there's actually some merit in thinking about what your objectives are, and that will help uh, the next steps and the next course of action to become apparent. Uh, is that something that's happened to you, Christina, when you've been presented with roles and, and choices to make? Yeah, it's just weighing where it fits in with my goals and objectives at the moment and, and how, you know, will that suit me in the future? Okay, Melda, what, what about you? Have you got a plan or, or what have you seen within the work that you do within the source? What, what's your thoughts on this? Uh, yes, well, for me, I think it's absolutely critical to have a plan, whatever your goals are. Um, and to Lara's point, yes, it can be quite confronting and really to get over that first hurdle. And, but there's, I think, various different ways you can um, combat that. And, um, you know, I mean, there's, there's various different ways that people uh, look at it with, you know, smart plans to doing simple, measurable, achievable, realistic and time based plans and maybe starting off with a very small plan and then redefining it and, and adding to it as you discover yourself um, what you're actually looking for. And um, very important as well to write that down rather than just keep it in your head because you are 1.4 times more likely to achieve it if you have it written down. And um, so, yes, I suppose the first hurdle, where do you start? How do you know what you're looking for? Um, I think one of the biggest things that we see is when our candidates follow what they're passionate about, they tend to be more successful and they tend to have a clear understanding of, of what career they're looking for. Um, sometimes it can be very helpful to get a mentor to maybe help you with that guidance. So it could be somebody inside your company or outside of your, your organization that may be in a role that you're striving to move towards in the future and may not end up being that because you may amend your plan as you go through but they can really help you define what are the skills that you need for your future role and start developing them now. It could be as simple as, you know, you want to move into a leadership role um, in the future. However, you don't have that opportunity right now. So that's when you can take on mentoring other individuals in your team to just start building those skills as you go through. Um, so for me, yes, a, a plan is, uh, is imperative. And that sounds to me like uh, having a bit of forward thinking can help you identify opportunities to get those skills as you go along. So it does, it does uh, play to yeah. both our, our panel members' thoughts about plans, but uh, the flexibility to, to adjust as you see opportunities arise. Is that something that you've, yeah. you've found yourself, Imelda? Yeah. Um, yeah, most definitely. And, and also, I suppose, to um, Christina's point around, um, you know, understanding, you know, is it finance that's driving you or is it more, again, around that work-life balance? Um, one, of, uh, one of the things as well that we notice is really defining whether it's, you know, maybe you're moving into a new organization and really understanding what they can offer you. So that's part of your plan. So understanding what the culture is, what the expectations are, what the career path, uh, paths are as well. Um, and again, networking always really helps with that to kind of uh, understand what other opportunities are out there. But this all ties back into going back to your plan, but always reevaluating it and um, constantly um, amending as, as I suppose you, your goals slightly change along the way. Okay, so a variety of views about plans there from our panel and a number of ways that we can think about 
the future and how we might set ourselves up uh, to move forward and be successful in the next step that we take in our careers. Okay, if you're like me, you've made a few mistakes in your career choices. Perhaps some of you have stayed in an organisational role for too long, or perhaps you've chopped and you've changed between roles and organisations in a short period of time. And what's our panel's experience on this side of things, I wonder? Imelda, let's start with you. What's one thing that you've got wrong in your career that you'd do differently um, if you could do that time again and that our listeners can learn from? Uh, sure. So I actually might answer this in respect to candidates that I've seen. Um, I think it'll be more relevant to our listeners today. So one of the biggest things I've seen, to be quite honest with you, is um, individuals being motivated by money, or can I say blindsided by the money side of things. Um, I've seen many candidates receive large offers, uh, you know, the eyes have lit up and they've just accepted the role and made the move into, a, you know, made a new organization, really, um, and, and failing to do their due diligence on the organization and maybe the challenges with the role or understanding who the, the uh, new leader is going to be. Um, so yes, you know, sometimes this can work out, but more than often, it can lead to some tricky situations. Um, it can be that the candidate wants to leave after just a few months. Um, you know, maybe they end up actually taking a step back in their career because they've gone into a role where they really didn't understand the expectations. They may have been unrealistic, or even sometimes they may have been outside of their capability. Um, and both their professional and personal life suffer because of this. So um, one thing I would say, you know, if you are making the move, it is so in, incredibly important to do your research and due diligence on organizations. So no matter what the offer, sometimes if it sounds too good to be true, it might be. I'm not saying that's always the case, but just do your research and um, don't be afraid to ask the difficult questions. You know, it's, um, it's perfectly acceptable to interview the, the uh, interviewer just as much as you're being interviewed and, and really be strategic in your career move. Think more long term, not just, you know, I suppose right now what the next role is, really think more long term. Okay, that's great. That's a great piece of advice. Um, what, what about you, Christina? What have you, you learned along the way that you'd like to share with our listeners? As you have heard from my introduction, I've been at the same company for 19 years. I've been fortunate to be in various roles during my tenure. I started as a buyer, worked my way to manager, senior manager, director, and then with the most recent uh, global procurement role. Since 2016. With the exception of my last role, I've always tried to not be in a role longer than two years, hence why I've probably been at the same company for so long. If I do not feel I'm being challenged, I do become bored, and that's just not a good spot to be in for myself or even my colleagues or the organization. I really find this question at this time very timely as I'm in process now as we move into a new year to evaluate where I am. What is that next thing that I want to do? Do I stay internal? Do I look at explore externally? I think for me, the biggest takeaway I have is just really evaluate my successes, um, understand what I really like in part of my role, and what is that part of my role that's really driving me to even ask myself if it's time for me to move on. This can help me really determine and help anyone determine what is next, and decide to move in a, role, a new role, what will make you happy and successful. Okay, so don't get stuck and, and really reflect on what you're enjoying and what you want to do more of in the future as you go along rather than, than getting sort of stuck stuck in the, the, same, uh, in the same thing and, and perhaps feeling that you can't make a change, yeah? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay, what about you, Lara? What, uh, have you got any tips you'd like to, to share with our listeners from your experience? Long way you've worked in a variety of companies, haven't you? Yeah, look, I think um, for me, um, I, I think getting that balance right between um, diversity of experience, um, as Christina just mentioned, you know, continually refreshing yourself and taking on new challenges, but balancing that with the the amount of time it takes for you to have an impact in roles so um, you can both learn and deliver at the same time. I think for me though, what's been my uh, biggest challenge and one that I continue to grapple with is really around time management and um, by that I mean the amount of time I'm allocating to my work versus my life outside of work. Um, 
which I continually struggle with because I think it's one of those things where unless you have really clear boundaries, um, and mine have been a bit shaky over my career, unless you've got really clear boundaries about um, you know, what you want, where your work stops, um, it's very hard to, to draw a strong line and stick to it. I think the second thing, though, in terms of time management at work is earlier in my career, um, you know, I wanted to get lots and lots of stuff done. Um, I was certainly a bit of a control freak, wanted to do it all myself because I felt that, you know, I would get it done the best. Um, but what I've obviously realized over time is that um, it really, most of the stuff that, you know, I was doing at work wasn't really moving the dial. Um, and I didn't need to be the one that was doing it myself. And so trying to prioritize more, trying to delegate more, and then bringing that all together so that I can also spend more time with my family outside of work or doing things that I want to do, looking after my personal health, um, seeing my friends, um, I could get a more rounded and more effective um, way of being, I suppose. Yes, and that uh, ability to um, delegate and to be able to trust other people to to do a good job is part of the, the steps up the career ladder, isn't it? Um, is that something that you found, Christina, in your career uh, as a thing that you've developed is, is the ability to delegate and to uh, sort of empower your team to, to get on with things that you perhaps would have, would have kept to yourself in the past? Yeah, delegation. Delegation is very, you know, important. Um, I have struggled with it in the past. But I have learned that the only way that I can accomplish what I need to and have some sort of, you know, balance and really just accomplish all the tasks is to learn how to delegate and trust your team. Excellent. So that's, uh, yeah, that's a great uh, learning point that's chiming across uh, our guests today. And thanks very much for sharing those learning points with our listeners and some great advice there for them to think about. Okay, let's move on then to thinking about taking a step up into a promoted role. Uh, Christina, you've had a career path that's taken you on a journey from a regional to a global role. And how did the roles you've done in the past give you the building blocks for the next career step? Yeah. So when I moved into the global role, the global role was brand new for Rico. Um, I was part of a project team where we evaluated all of RICO's indirect procurement spend. And as you can imagine, for a global organization, one of the categories of spend that has a lot of opportunity for cost savings is travel and expense. Since I managed to program in the U.S. and I was quite successful, I was asked to be a lead for the project. During the project evaluation, it was apparent that we needed a global leader, and due to my depth and experience and successes in the U.S., I was asked to be part of the global team reporting directly to Japan. I also feel the tenure and the fact that I understand the RICO culture of my organization, I was able to be asked to take on this global role. So real stepping stones then along the way of starting with a regional focus of building up your expertise and then that naturally giving you positioning you really well for the next step up then correct I feel it was really important to understand at least part of the organization regionally before I moved into that global role okay um, Laura you've worked for some of the world's most recognizable brands um, and how do you feel these jobs have positioned you for career moves into different organizations different parts of the globe. It's quite a different career path from Christina's, isn't it? For me, um, it, the brands have been important because they provided, um, I guess, a certain amount of, um, or an appearance of credibility. I think, for me, the, the biggest benefit of working for the rec these quite recognizable brands is that they all came with quite distinct cultures. And so the benefit for me from a career perspective is that I've gotten a really good understanding of how a company's culture can really help or hinder its performance. And, um, you know, I, I've worked in seven different companies uh, and four different continents over the course of my career. And while most of these companies have been phenomenally successful, culturally they've been polar extremes and so have achieved their success in very different ways. And 
what that's meant to me personally is that I've had to really learn to flex my style quite considerably over time to adapt. And um, as I think about you know my own leadership style, it's really a mix of, or I try, I, I aspire to make it a mix of the best bits um, from each of those cultures. Um, if I take, for example, you know Rio Tinto, it was um, phenomenal processes, uh, just great rigor in terms of um, how it got things done. It's been very different to Google, where there really is no process. Um, the pace is is extremely fast, and uh, people are perhaps a little less risk averse. And so, trying to take the pros of Rio and apply them to Google, and likewise, you know, trying to learn as much as I can about what really works well in this culture um, have been things that I think have been useful ammunition for me uh, through the course of my career. Excellent. So really, yeah, that idea that being able to uh, think about different cultures and to to use that experience as you move to different organisations, that's really interesting. Uh, what, what insight have you discovered from candidates that you see at, at the source in Elda? Um, I think in terms of, of really setting yourself up for future su success, it's really about getting involved and, and taking on new challenges and, and projects where possible, really going that extra mile. Um, also, what we're seeing a big trend in recent years is that, uh, particularly in procurement, um, we're seeing that there is more of a focus on soft skills than the technical side of procurement. Um, I suppose a lot of the technical side of procurement and the processes are being either outsourced or automate, automated. So it's really imperative to hone in on what can't be automated. Well, at least not now and not very well yet uh, in certain areas. Um, but yes, again, some of the most sought after skills really are influencing, being customer focused, like building those stakeholder and, um, and supplier relationships, negotiations, commercial acumen. So we're seeing that hiring managers are focusing more on those soft skills because they believe that the technical skills or the technical elements of procurement skills can be easier to, to teach than the soft skills. Um, and I suppose, again, coming back to what I said earlier about uh, the, the leadership piece um, as well. So as you move up the ladder, you may find there's more of an emphasis on, on leadership or in strategy. So really just being able to, to find opportunities to, um, to hone in and maybe to develop those skills, even if it's not exactly um, in your position description right now. So find an opportunity to mentor others. Uh, we're also seeing a big shift um, from uh, organizations focusing on more of a dollar saved um, and really moving more to other value adds to an organization that procurement can bring. So, you know, hiring managers are asking more now uh, what have candidates done um, in their procurement career outside of cost savings? So, you know, what are you most proud of? Um, and we're seeing, you know, areas that are really coming up are maybe involvement in sustainability programs or maybe other commercial ben benefits such as, you know, maybe adding on a revenue stream through procurement um, initiatives, process improvement or, or various different other um, innovative ideas. So these are all just going that little extra mile than, than you may normally um, do in your role. And again, follow what you're passionate about because then you're most likely to be uh, more successful. Excellent. So that, that theme of soft skills has flowed through all the answers we've had about, about people, about um, across organizations, across continent, um, culture, thinking about culture, thinking about how we influence and that's a fantastic range of of roles and experiences from our panel members that you've you've shared for our listeners to mull over and for me it's always fascinating to hear about the different career paths people have had and obviously my background's in the public sector and public service but uh, some things are very similar and some things are, are different so it's good to hear all those experiences in that answer to the question so thanks for that okay there's been a lot of discussion about diversity in senior leadership roles in, in the press, in, in blog posts, in, in think pieces, um, and how diversity can produce and does produce better outcomes for organisations. And as we've got an all-woman panel today here on our podcast, I think we're in a really good position to discuss diversity for our listeners. Um, so let's tap into um, your experience today um, and see how women as, as well women in leadership in executive roles can can pave the way for aspiring future leaders and Zara you're a senior leader um, does that make a difference for people in your team or organization that you're a you're a woman senior leader or that you're you're thinking about diversity how's that making a difference for you 
I think there's sort of three three ways in which, um, as a woman, I try to, um, I guess, pave the way for for other women. Um, and so I think that the first one is just in the same way that you know any leader can pave the way for somebody else is around sponsorship and mentorship. Um, and I think being very, I think being very active in that space. Um, and particularly, you know, we've all sort of read the the research that says sometimes men are less willing to be mentors or sponsors for 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 women. Um, so being deliberate about who I sponsor and who I mentor. Um, is sort of one one element of it. I think the other sort of um, two pieces around uh, being a woman senior leader and, and trying to use that influence is, I think as a woman often, um, or really, you know, all as individuals, it's, there's an onus mask to, to call out when there's BS in the room and bias bust. Um, and I think it's obviously a lot easier to do that when you have a senior position uh, than when you don't. In theory, of course, anybody can... Um, can call out biases, but I think your voice carries a lot more when you're senior. Um, and so I try where where I can to to make a conscious effort to do that. And you know, it's something that really um, I've I think earlier in my career I was far more reticent to speak out um, when I saw those sort of subtle biases. Um, but really, being more deliberate about it now has been. I, I can see the impact, and I try and do it more. I think the third piece is really around um, setting an example. So for me, just seeing that there were other senior leaders who were women or who looked like me was in itself um, a motivation. Beyond that, though, um, it was important to see women who had those senior roles, but who had their boundaries as well. So, um, you know, or, or who sort of demonstrate an example. So that might be they go home and see their kids at a certain time rather than feeling they need to do the FaceTime that some of the male colleagues might do. Or it might simply be that they were unafraid to ask sort of ballsy and challenging questions um, and didn't just play sort of the little woman role. Um, and so I, I try um, and be very conscious about how I'm acting um, in front of you know, in front of uh, people people um, in the organisation because I think part of that is a representation of myself, but it's also um, people are taking away from my actions how they perceive women to be in the workplace to some extent. I think that's really interesting. The three things that you've you've highlighted there, some some really good points that you've made about uh, women in leadership. Imelda, what's been your experience in the recruitment space? Um, yes, I always encourage females in, in leadership roles to endorse other females within their organization. I think it's really um, imperative. So whether it be in a meeting and, you know, uh, highlighting them or giving them an opportunity to share their ideas or something as simple on a LinkedIn post where maybe you're highlighting some amazing work that they've done, um, this will increase their, their personal brand. So it really shows that you're supporting them and, and making them more visible. Um, another way can be profiling female talent across your organization. So as simple as reaching out to internal female candidates and, and encouraging them to raise your hand and apply for an opportunity. Um, even if they don't feel they meet 100% of their requirements. Um, we see this all the time where a female may only um, have 70% of the requirements for a role, or at least they think in their mind they only have 70%, but they actually can 100% do the role. They second guess themselves. And then on the other hand, the male counterparts may not uh, have the, the necessary skills, but they have more than enough confidence to think they can do it. Um, I can't count how many times I've mentioned a procurement role um, that I'm recruiting to my fiancé, and his response has always been, oh, I could do that role easily. Now, bear in mind, the man has never done procurement in his life. <laughs> However, female candidates of mine um, that I discuss a role with will, will almost question their capability. So I think it's really um, important, again, for females in leadership to endorse their female counterparts and really to, I suppose, give them that support and lift their, their confidence. And I think even more importantly, um, uh, for women in executive leadership roles, if they have the opportunity make an impact on um, on the company's policy. Uh, so there's many ways that, that this can um, um, have an impact, so whether it's recruitment strategy uh, policy, making sure that you must have a 50-50 shortlist, um, having a flexibility policy, 
uh, returning to workshop programs, um, again, um, as Laura mentioned, um, with the mentoring side, so encouraging women mentoring programs to really help develop them into leadership roles as well. Excellent. So that's a lot of tips there around women. If Christina, you've been promoting diversity and you might want to broaden it out for, for women or you might want to stay with that theme and you've been winning awards for your work for many years now. What's your view on how we can pave the way for more diversity in the future? So for me, supplier diversity has been part of my procurement role. And I actually find this is probably the area of my role that I'm the most passionate about. Our supplier diversity program and strategy within RICO is really focused around finding those diverse businesses, minority, women, veteran-owned, et cetera, to really be part of our procurement strategy. And we want to help grow their business and also meet the goals of our customers by adding value. Often we find that the smaller businesses really bring to the table a more innovative approach, more flexibility as they are smaller and nimble. I contribute to successes um, of being able to grow the supplier diversity program really because of our leadership with Enrico as both the CEO and our EVP of HR really has a strong commitment to diversity. And another thing that I really find important is being able to provide education to all of our stakeholders and the different business functions about what having a diverse workforce and supply chain really does for the organization. And it's really important that our organization understands, you know, what diversity really is, that it's more than just the race and gender. It's really about the diverse backgrounds that are brought to the table and really the different knowledge one background brings. I think we can use this panel today as an, exa an excellent example, since we are all women, but we are from different cultures and fields, and look at the different perspectives we are all bringing. Yep, absolutely, Christina. I think that's, uh, you know, raised a good point about the, the panel and, you know, deliberately choosing panel members from across the, the world, from different backgrounds, does bring lots of different lenses to um, a question, doesn't it? And you know, I think we've covered different ways to promote diversity, both within the workforce and in our supply chains within those answers. So some excellent tips and insight that our listeners can take away and think about how they might practically apply them in their roles today. Let's move on then. Many of our listeners will be looking to make a career step up to a more senior role in 2020. I'm going to stay with Christina to start us off on this question. What advice can you give our listeners to, about making the transition to a global procurement director role? So the biggest takeaway I think I can share when I moved from the regional role to the global role was really being able to understand the different cultures and that whole dynamic. Being at RICO for so long, I really learned how to navigate for the U.S. and globally was definitely a challenge. I always seemed in the U.S. they have the ability to be easily liked and it was easier to be an influencer. But when I took the global role, I felt like I needed to prove myself all over again and that I really had the skill set to do that role and demonstrate to the Ricos outside the U.S. that I really was a business partner and I wanted to work with them to find a global solution that would also work for their region and bring the same results that we were trying to achieve globally. I also learned that sometimes things just take a little longer than you would like for successes to occur. But in the end, really the key was listening to my key stakeholders, keeping that dialogue open and just communicating as, as frequently as I could. Yep, so all those skills from the regional stepping up and, and standing you in good stead in the global and a bit of patience there by the sounds of it along the way for some of the things you're trying to achieve, yeah? Correct, and I think it really was what Imelda had mentioned earlier is really having more of those soft skills than the technical skills, which I would say, you know, really led to the success of being that overall business partner versus just here is, you know, the tactical part of the procurement role. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Laura, you're currently the finance director for Google UK. 
But what advice can you give our listeners about transitioning from a senior leadership role to one that has a seat at the C-suite table? Sure, I, I think there's um, a couple of things that I might say. That The first is um, the importance of setting the right tone from the top. Obviously, as you move up in the organization, your span of influence and span of control increases. Um, you become increasingly visible. And so um, what you say, how you act, whether you're doing what you said you would and what the company policy or company cultural aspiration is becomes even more important. And so um, making sure that um, you're very aware of how you're acting in front of um, the rest of the organization, I think, is much it's increasingly important the more senior you become um, and the more visible you become. So that would be one. I think the second thing that was a change for me is um, moving from being a functional lead to thinking of myself as a member of the board of um, the organization. So um, in earlier roles, I'd very much sort of box myself into being uh, the representative from finance on particular issues. Um, I think you know when you're sort of um, part of a sort of a board or a management team or a C-suite, um, there's an onus on you to um, also have a voice on matters beyond your particular function and to act as sort of an owner or a board of the company rather than just the finance person. Um, so those have been the two sort of pivots that have been important for me. So really having that strategic broader lens that we we talk about that quite a lot in procurement these days about um, contributing to the business about thinking about the business objectives and obviously you're now living that through the role and being part of the strategy makers and the strategy leaders in, in the work that you're doing now so not just the, fa the finance strategy but the whole the whole thing has that meant you've had to find out about you know, or, or get up to speed with the things that perhaps didn't cross your path in finance before? Yeah, I mean, I think from a, you know, being in finance, you tend to see, um, well, you do see all the entire business. So in terms of getting up to speed on the business, less so. Um, the bit that's been bigger for me, though, and not something that you typically deal with as a finance, as a finance person is really around getting involved in sort of um, more people-related issues, so um, thinking about how we can, uh, how what the values of the, of the team should be or the organization, what the culture should be, um, and then thinking about sort of what are the finances processes, uh, finance processes we can um, leverage to achieve those. So, for example, how we incentivize people, how we, um, you know, what, how, how we put together a business plan that, that ties together not just the finance drivers, but also the cultural drivers, the organizational dynamics, um, and, and basically having a much more holistic view, as, as you talked about, in terms of setting and implementing strategy. Okay, great. So um, finally, what insight have you discovered from the candidates you see at the source, Melda? Anything you want to share with us on that? Um, yeah, so if you want to be a leader in procurement, I think you need to be seen as, as just that, and uh, not as simply a technical expert. Um, I feel procurement professionals have very similar traits to successful C-level execs, such as you know, focus on leadership, collaboration, and, and influencing uh, strategic orientation, change leadership. I mean, the list goes on. Um, so it's really important to, to make procurement visible to the C-suite and, and really show the value that you can add, that you have those transferable skills. So meet with your execs regularly, go the extra mile uh, when you're discussing what you've achieved and I suppose also importantly what you want to achieve, what your vision is for the uh, procurement function and how that correlates to the strategy of the C-suite. Um, so that you can add more value than I think what a lot of people view as traditional procurement um, and procurement is constantly changing and, and, and adapting so really um, show C-suite that it is. Uh, what innovations have you introduced? Um, you know, maybe you focus on sustainability policy that's having a large impact on, on the organization now. Um, maybe you've created revenue streams um, that are worth highlighting. Um, and I think as well, what's very important when you're making the transition across um, into the role and maybe a little bit of unknown territory, it's really important, again, to have a mentor to, to help you guys uh, guide you through this. Um, you can, maybe somebody who's been in a similar role in the past and they can talk you through the, the highs and lows and how to, uh, how to combat that as well. 
thanks for that, Imelda. And obviously, we're doing our part on the webinar today to be a to be a bit of a virtual men mentor for our listeners out there wanting to, to take the step up in 2020. Okay, we're on to the penultimate question now. Uh, I know when I look back over my career, there are a few things that I've done that have really made a difference to my success. So let's ask the panel what they've done. Um, back back to Imelda for this one. What's been the key to your career success? Um, I think it's probably bringing us back to the, the first question. Um, I, um, I definitely, I suppose, have practiced what I preach in terms of a career plan. Um, so in a nutshell, I've always been quite strategic in my career. Um, I've been quite lucky that I have found what I'm passionate about and I knew exactly what the role I wanted was. It was just a matter of finding the right company that aligned my values, goals, vision. And so it's lucky I found that in the source. Um, I knew the opportunity that I wanted, and I wanted to be an expert in one field, which is probably contradicting what I say about procurement, about not just being technical, but being, um, you know, being more more focused on the on the soft skills. But in my field, um, you definitely need to be an expert instead of wanting to be everything to everyone. So focusing on a procurement niche has really enabled me to build my network. It's really been critical uh, to the, my success as a recruiter, um, and I think that's you know more generally um, in anybody's career as well to really focus on again what they're passionate for. So I think it's really important to, I suppose, taking away from that is to always be learning, always be taking on new challenges, and always be developing yourself. I think that's what probably um, got me where I am today. How about you, Christina? So having a good network, both externally and internally, has really been a key for me. Since we don't really have a formal mentorship program here, I think my having my network has really given me the opportunity to choose, you know, who I want to be that mentor for me when I'm having a challenge or I'm having, you know, that thought of what do I do next in my career. I also feel being a woman leader, it's really important to have a good network of women leaders who are basically your personal board of directors women who guide you, not be biased, and who can really relate to some of the struggles that you may have or had in your career. Excellent. And what about you, finally, Lara? What, what uh, tips have you got for our listeners? Yeah, I think um, maybe to build on uh, Christina's theme about um, finding great people to support you and to um, enable you, I. I've done my best work when um, I've either hired amazing people um, or I've found um, really smart, great collaborative people elsewhere in the organization to work with. Um, and so I think surrounding yourself with um, great people is 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 a great is a great um, enabler of your own career success and also I mean I found it very enjoyable. So that's been one. I think the other thing for me has been about, trying to figure out what's my super strength. So um, I think often we focus on all the development areas um, and all the things that we could do better and what we need to work on. Um, but I think if I, if I think about where I've really had the most impact, it's where I've focused on things that I'm really good at um, and, and tried to find roles that enabled me to leverage that strength. So um, those would be my two uh, career success keys. Excellent. Thanks very much. Some great insight there for us from our panel that I'm sure our listeners can use. Well, time's flown by and we're coming to the end of our time on the webinar today. Um, so let's leave our listeners with one step that they can take today if they're contemplating making a big step forward in their careers at the start of this new decade. Imelda, let's start with you. What's uh, one step that you would recommend our listeners take today? Um, yeah, so I think summing up what I've said today, I really encourage everybody out there to be strategic, write down what you want from your career, and then put that plan in place. And remembering to always, I suppose, go after what gives you a sense of achievement and happiness. So think long term, um, and also really do your research on organizations and invest in developing um, your soft skills and capability gaps. Excellent. Thanks, Imelda. Uh, Christina, what's your one step that you'd like to share as the final point? I think it's really to not be afraid to explore something that may be out of your comfort zone and really truly evaluate what you need from your career and your goals, regardless if it's financial, title, or just overall balance in your life. 
Excellent. And finally, from Lara, what, what tip have you got for our listeners? Well, mine are going to be very similar, actually. Um, I think the first is uh, to build on the Melda's earlier points, really, is don't just look at the paycheck, um, look at the whole package and don't underestimate the importance of finding a place with a great culture um, and great people um, because you're going to spend most of your living hours at work, so really important to be happy. I think the other piece, um, just building on what Christina said about being out of your comfort zone is there's often a value in sometimes going off the beaten path as it can really be a source of differenti differentiation sometimes. And so um, I think if you back yourself, sometimes taking a high-risk career strategy can really pay off. Um, so those would be my two. Excellent. Wonderful tips to end our webinar with today. So that's the end of our webinar. Don't quit your day job, your path to the top. Many thanks to our panel, Lara Nakrishbandi, Finance Director, Google UK, Christina Morrow, Director, Global Procurement, Rico USA, and Imelda Walsh, Manager at The Source. Okay, listeners, I'm sure our panel members have left you feeling intrigued and wanting to find out more about how you can succeed in your career. Well, the good news is we've got lots of content over on Procurus that can help. So why not head on over to Procurus and check out the blogs, webinars and podcasts we've got on this topic. And while you're on Procurious, why not sign up to be a digital delegate for the London Big Ideas Summit, which is taking place in March. Our theme is Dream Big, and we'll be discussing sustainability, transformation, diversity, innovation, and much, much more. Just click on the link on the events page to register as a digital delegate. You've been listening to the webinar, Don't Quit Your Day Job, Your Path to the Top, powered by Procurious. Thank you for taking the time to join us today.